welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on our show, we have Warren James, and Warren and I are new friends, and we share some great mutual friends, many of who have been guests on this show. And my instincts told me he'd be a great one to talk to today. Warren is a trance medium, psychical researcher, collector and administrator of the Facebook group, Sacred Dance with Trance. Warren James, a welcome, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hello, good afternoon to you, Sandra. It's afternoon over here in the UK. It's morning your time, isn't it? It sure is, but I have a big smile on my face and sometimes I get all jumbled in my introductions because I'm excited. That's part of being me, so... <laughs> so Welcome. don't worry, I get, I get, I usually run off on a tangent and uh, um, uh, chat too much. So that's my nerves and part of being me, also. <laughs> yeah, because there are nerves, and that's just part of being human. And this is great, and I'm thankful for technology to connect us. And even though we're five time zones uh, different, but I know from just chatting on Facebook that you'd be a great one to talk to. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and the good news is we really don't know that much about each other, so I would love to hear your story, because it's a very interesting world we dabble in now, the life after death, and um, you being a trance medium, and who knows what else. So what would you tell us a little bit about your story, how you got into this? Because I know you've got other things that you do. This may not be a full-time job for you, but uh, how did you get into this, Warren? Yeah, well, it's it's definitely not a full time job. In fact, I, I treat it in the same way as a meditator might treat their meditation. Uh, I treat it as uh, something that is developing uh, and that I participate in. Uh, and I don't do it for a living. Um, I can't envisage a day when I will. But, you know, who knows? It, it's development is a, is a strange path. And often your path winds into directions that you never expected it would do. Right. Um, but my first, my first, uh, going back to, I was born in 1982. Um, and I, my mum and my auntie are both interested in mediums and psychics and all things supernatural like that. Um, and I, was born into that kind of family. It's mainly my mum and my auntie, but some of the members of the family are interested. And I grew up hearing words about mediums and, and what have you. Uh, and also grew up at a time when Doris Stokes, Doris Fisher Stokes was a, one of the first real famous mediums in the UK. And I remember that people were reading her books, but I never understood any of it. Um, my mum tells me that as a little boy, I did say some strange things like, one evening, she asked, uh, I asked her what she was doing in my room last night. And she said, oh, I'd just come in to check on your hamster. I had a pet hamster. But the thing is, she hadn't actually been in my room. Oh. <laughs> so, but I don't really remember that. Uh, I do have one memory, uh, which must have been when I was around five years, six years of age, perhaps. But it's one of those memories where looking back, I wonder, did I dream it? Did I imagine it? But it was quite a, a, a dramatic thing if it did happen, and it frightened me. Um, I, I saw something, so and it and it freaked me out a little bit. Uh, as a little child, I was obviously sensitive <laughs> and didn't didn't like it. Um, and there was there wasn't any other experiences whatsoever until. But I always had an interest in it. And then in nine in two thousand year two thousand and two, I moved from where I lived, which was near Liverpool in the north of England to the Midlands in the, in the center of the UK, uh, to Coventry. And when I, I came here to pursue a music career and the person who I was came to live with and work with, uh, also shared an interest in mediumship and life after death. So we had a lot in common. And as time progressed, I, uh, he, I should say, he is now my circle leader, Paul. He joined a circle uh, which was sitting to develop physical mediumship. And I'd never heard of it. So 
at that particular point, uh, I had no knowledge of physical mediumship, no real knowledge of trance. I'd, the only trance I'd seen at that point was an old clip of Colin Fry and his spirit guide, Magnus. Yes. And I just thought it was Colin Fry putting on a silly voice. Right. That's, I had no reason to think anything different, you know. Uh, and I wasn't so open-minded as I am now. Uh, so I... I put my friend Paul joined a circle. He told me what was going on and what things were happening. And I just followed with interest, you know. You'll have to excuse if you can hear the rain behind me. I'm sitting in the conservatory and it's just started raining. Yeah, so, I can hear it. That's okay. Can you hear? So um, he, his circle, uh, this circle he was in was going and, you know, doing okay. So I suggested, well, why don't we start a circle? So we did from home uh, every Tuesday night, I think it was. We had uh, big bay windows and I set about blacking out these huge windows to put the room into total darkness because we understood that that's how physical phenomenon will develop is in the dark. Right. Um, so we blocked out every, it took like two and a half hours to get this, the living room blacked out. I don't know why we didn't use a smaller room, <laughs> but we didn't. <laughs> and, um, and we sat we sat every week, probably for 18 months uh, in total. I think tw 18 months in total, and it was around 12 months in, nothing had ever happened. We just sat in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, the television or other objects in the room might click or tap, but it was just movement of the house. It was There was no absolutely no phenomenon taking place whatsoever. And certainly I never and he never really felt anything uh, and then one night there was a sound from the top of the ceiling. It sounded like static electricity. And that was the first sound we got. Uh, and we thought it, we couldn't find any logical reasons what, where that had come from. So we continued to sit. And then a gentleman who was in that other circle that Paul was a member of uh, said that at the spiritualist church, there was going to be a, a trance workshop and perhaps Warren would like to come along. So we booked for it, and I did say I would like to go along. And and what happened was, it's strange, that the medium from the other circle came along to sit in our circle that night, uh, one night, just before the trans workshop took place that I was going on. And when she sat, uh, she went into trance, and I'd never heard anybody go into trance before. And a person came through, introduced himself as Montague, his name was Montague, and he said that he has waited to work with this circle, and he will do. Mm -hmm. and, one, and we said, well, who will the medium be? Can you help us? And he said, yes, it'll be Warren. Oh, wow. So I sat there, yeah, every hair on my neck stood on end, <laughs> and I sat there thinking, this, this isn't real. It can't be. So I thought, well, somebody's got to be the medium. And if it is me, let's see what happens at this trance workshop, which I went to, um, sat there all day. There was probably about 10 people, maybe, maybe slightly less. And I observed these people sitting. They used a cabinet um, to sit in, sitting in the cabinet. Uh, and I heard all manner of, of uh, people speaking and saying what I thought was the most peculiar things I'd ever seen or heard. I, I wasn't impressed. I, I thought these people are bonkers. Yeah. Uh, I thought this is silly. You know, nobody's given anything of any worth because by this time I'd read the Arthur Finley uh, book on the edge of the etheric and I'd seen exactly and read exactly what was possible, uh, that you could have two world communication. They should be able to bring your loved ones through. They should be able to prove what they are saying. They, you know, not only say these inspirational words, but they should be able to give genuine proof. And none of that ever came that day. I went and sat in the cabinet. My friend Paul sat in the cabinet. He came with me. I went in three times that day and absolutely nothing and there was no way uh, I was going to 
do what was suggested, which was say the first thing that comes into your mind and spirit will lead it. I just wasn't prepared to do that because to me it seemed insane to do that. Yeah. Um, if it's going to happen, I want to hit. I want to know it's real. So the day continued. Um, we got close to the end of the day, and I thought, well, everybody's had their amateur dramatics moment. They've all had their opportunity to 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 do to say whatever they thought they were doing and. And I thought, that's it. Waste of £10. That's what I thought. And they said, there's just time for one more person to go and sit. Um, Because I was the youngest, they were all mainly ladies in their 50s, 60s, perhaps. So I I was probably only about 24, 25 at that particular time. They, for that reason, I think they said, go on, Warren, you go in again. Go on, do it again. I thought, can't be bothered. (laughs) You know, I really can't be bothered with this. So just to please them, you did. I went and sat. I did. And and the, uh, the circle leader uh, or the, the workshop leader, John, said, would it help if everybody stayed quiet? Because what the people had been doing all afternoon was professing whoever sat in there that they could see a moustache or I could see a beard. Oh, oh no. can you see a, a Chinese man? Can you see this? Yes, can you yes. see that? And I thought, blimey, you know, this this must be like the common, this must be like the Olympics here because we've got every nationality <laughs> under the sun allegedly showing up on people's faces. And I thought this is mental. So I said, yes, it would, because I just wanted them to shut up, to be honest. And I really didn't, I wasn't interested by this point. So I just closed my eyes and sat there and I thought, well, in a few minutes, he'll say, you know, come back. And not that I've been anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I sat there in the quiet. And at that moment, something happened. Unexpected. I felt something. I felt um, a weight on my mind is the only way I can describe it. I felt a tingling sensation coming down my hands and my arms into my fingers it was similar to pins and needles, but not as pronounced and, and somehow slightly different, but it's the closest comparison I can give you. And in that moment, m- I felt my trembling hands lift up from the arms of the chair, the fingers crossed over uh, or, or, or crossed in some fashion and out an urge, a push from my throat forced these few sentences out and he said his name was Montague the same name that the lady who sat with our circle the medium who sat with our circle uh, brought through that that night a few weeks earlier and he said that he has waited to work with me and my circle my friend now circle leader Paul was present apparently he had tears in his eyes uh, because he, he realized that I wouldn't do that because of my questioning inquisitive mind. I would not let myself do something yes. uh, for the sake of it. And that was the first time it happened. And I wanted afterwards to get out of that room. I, I didn't, I didn't like it. It was alien. He, his personality came through. I heard every word he said, um, but I felt out of I felt I couldn't control that coming forward. Those words it just happened in that moment. Mm-hmm. With that, everything went in reverse. The the, the feelings subsided. Uh, the weight that was on my mind, uh, on my brain, if you like, lifted, and I just wanted to get out of that room. It really shook me up. It unnerved me, and and I think I sat outside and smoked about five cigarettes one after the. <laughs> <laughs> And it, they insisted that we carried on and closed the, the circle down. And then we went home and we sat probably then for another, probably another eight months. Uh, I think only twice or three times in that eight month period did anybody do that again to me speak. And it never felt quite the same, but that's how the journey started from that particular moment there. And the, with exception to a four-year gap where I stopped developing or stopped sitting to develop because of my work commitments and my life at the time, that's how the journey began, yeah. 
That's so spectacular. And I've heard that from several people that you just get a little taste of it to show that it's real. And then it could be quite a long time before um, they come back. Yes. Yeah. I think in all, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'm fully accurate, but I would say probably only about in 18 months, four times. So we sat for 12 months with zero. And the first time it happened was on that workshop. I thought, this is it. I know how to do it. So the next time we sat and the time after and the time after that, I thought it'll happen. I know what to do. But the truth is, you don't know what to do because you don't do anything. They do it. <laughs> so that's right. Nothing. So nothing actually happened. <laughs> so I think in 18 months, we had four communications at that particular period. And then, as I say, we stopped for four years. And then my life started taking some very strange synchronicities, which gradually pulled me back towards the whole uh, subject. So my, a relationship I had came to an end. I uh, came back to live here where I am now, which is at my circle leader's house. I, I lodge here. And the ending of that relationship, uh, if you know, if you know, understand that sometimes when a relationship finishes, this is like a newfound freedom or a strange feeling of being independent again. Yes. And you start following things that you're interested in. So I got pulled back into it. And I started off, I, I always say I started off by getting very interested in the work of um, uh, researcher David Icke. Um, not, so, not for his conspiracy research, which I, I do find interesting, but mostly for his research into the nature of reality. What is this thing that we call reality? What is this body? What is th so he was going into that area of quantum physics and the, the working of the body and the mind and how it how it functions through the body. And I found it very interesting. And then uh, I had all these questions. I'd sat with physical medium Stuart Alexander in the January of that year. This would be 2014. Sat with Stuart Alexander at his home circle in Hull uh, in Yorkshire, England. And it was a nice experience. I remember thinking, I, I want to see it again. I've seen it once, but I want to see it again so I can come in with a knowing mind now. And we booked, they had, uh, Stuart had added one extra guest circle uh, in the month of September, and it fell on my birthday, September the 11th. So there was only two seats. So myself and my now circle leader, Paul, walked, we, we went up there to in, in the September. But just before that, uh, I went uh, around the summertime of 2014, I had all these questions and they needed answers. And Paul kept saying to me, you really should have a sit-in with uh, Robert Goodwin and his spirit guide, White Feather, will answer all these questions, I'm certain of it. So I said, well, if it's meant to be, something will happen to make it happen. I'm, I'm not going to go ringing this guy and I don't expect you to do that, even though I know he, he wanted to and probably would. So I said, well, no, if it's meant to be, it will be. And no word of a lie, that very evening, out of nowhere, Robert's wife, this tra other transmedium's wife, sent a text message to Paul and said, we're just wondering, Robert's 60th birthday's coming up. Would you do the entertainment? Because we were both entertainers. And we've never had a text message before or since. So That's great. Great. You know, Paul said to me, that, there, you, there you are, Warren. He said, you wanted to sign? There's your sign. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect it to come within two hours, but it did. And uh, with that, I had a sit-in with Robert Goodwin. Uh, this would have been two weeks. So this would have been around the middle of August of 2014. I went and had a sit-in with Robert Goodwin, uh, spoke with his guide, White Feather, and it was very interesting because it was purely philo philosophy. So there was no proving survival beyond the death wasn't bringing anybody's relative but what he did do which i found fascinating i went in with a sheet of paper in my back pocket i think i had on it about 20 to 25 questions robert went into trance it was just done in his living room in ordinary daylight and his wife uh, chaired the event uh, to make sure he, she sat with him to make sure he was uh, okay and etc and 
as soon as he went into trance and white feather started to speak i slipped this piece of paper out of my pocket with my questions and white feather gave approximately 15 to 20 minute talk opening talk he didn't miss a word he didn't um or ah the words just flowed beautifully and his his, his way of speaking was gorgeous it really was gorgeous and inspiring but what amazed me in that 20 minutes i ticked best part of 19 questions off my list amazing it's as if even though there was no evidence of proving my loved ones or anybody specific had survived there was an evidential factor you see because he answered the questions and the only questions i had left i i think i asked let's say i had four or five I answered, I asked one and he answered, he answered two. <laughs> so it was quite amazing. So it sort of suggested to me that they had a knowledge of what I was going to be asking. Yes. Uh, and, and that was proved. So I had a, a lovely experience from that. And I do remember coming home in the car and sitting and saying to myself, you know, if, if I have got this ability, if it is within me, and after what I've just seen, maybe I really do have a duty to develop it. Maybe it is of great importance that I develop it. And I thought, well, that would mean sitting again, blacking out the room, blah, blah. I thought, oh, I don't know if I could do that again. <laughs> you know. And then the night of nights arrived. It was about two weeks later. I'd been to see, uh, with Paul, I'd been to see a friend's music group playing in a town about 10 miles from here where I am and we had in the pub we had uh, what we call a lock-in so the yeah, once 11 o'clock comes the pub's technically got to be closed by law but they locked the, they bolt the door up close the curtains and you have a late night drink and it's it's for those who were there and everybody was talking and what have you and I was probably I had a few to drink a few glasses of wine and a little bit merry and I remember sitting there feeling really really weird I was just so warm and heavy and I thought, don't feel right. I feel a bit unwell. So I closed my eyes and Paul tells me that he noticed my fingers had started to cross over. <laughs> and he said, God, that he thought to himself, God, that used to happen when he went into trance mm -hmm. years ago. And, and with that, somebody said my name and I jolted awake, went to the toilet and I said to Paul, I've really got to go. We've got to go. We need to leave now. I don't feel right. So he finished his drink. They opened the door and the landlord of the pub said, I'll see you lads. Take care. Safe journey home. I walked out. I heard the bolt go on the door behind me as he locked the door and he went in. And as I took five steps, I stopped and I said, I don't feel right, Paul. And with that, everything went black. And I woke up the next morning and I had no recollection of anything that had happened. And during that period, uh, apparently I'd gone, they'd taken control. They had instructed Paul what he had to do. They had given us specific instructions to follow, to develop, and told us what night they wanted to sit, us to sit. We want you to sit on a Tuesday. We want you to sit in the dark, and we want you to wait. We will instruct. And it, the amazing thing was, is this was on a busy main street and not a single car, not a single person went by. And Paul was just stuck there with me in this situation. Um, and I remember none of it. And at that point, I remember feeling very, very uh, annoyed, actually. I thought, who are these people that can do this to me? without my permission it, it didn't seem right um so another two weeks went by i found myself september had come around i was at stuart alexander's circle again he's a, obviously a physical and trans medium here in the uk of of good reputation and i went there i'd been there in the january nobody spoke to me from the spirit world that night i just enjoyed the event of watching the physical phenomena taking place and hearing other people's loved ones reuniting. Nothing happened for me. On this occasion, it was different. Uh, Walter, his, uh, his, one of his principal controls, 
came and spoke. He spoke to me directly and told me that you have a latent ability. Do you realize that? He said a gift that can be developed to quite a remarkable degree, if you so wish. And it'll be your choice. He said, but when the time's right and when that your life has taken a certain path, the door will open. And when it does so, it'll be your choice to walk through that door or it'll, it might always remain partly open. And he said, do you understand? I thought, well, bloody hell. I thought uh, two weeks ago, I had this dramatic experience. Two weeks before that, I had uh, a sitting with a guide. Uh, and just before that, I've had all these questions growing and I have been wondering whether I should rekindle my development. And that's when I decided to do it so that would we return to sitting in september of 2014 and everything that has developed since has developed in those few short years uh i've been very 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 fortunate to have a, a good circle but i've also been very fortunate that the, the, the development at the very start did move quite rapidly and now it's sort of uh, plateaued a little bit at the moment but it's always changing but that that's how it started that's that's basically it sandra incredible and i don't know thankfully too much about you except for i hear good things so i i mean, like thank you for um following your passion and really it's interesting warren because i'm hearing you talk and although i'm not where you are with trance I got a little taste yeah. of it at the Arthur Finley College that somebody spoke through me several times. Yeah. Knowing that I That's... could kind of hear it, but also yeah. being shocked because I'm not directing these words myself or thinking that. Yes. And there's no that's ums right. or ah or coming up for breath. No, that's 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 it. It it, it should flow somewhat effortlessly, I suppose. Um Although not necessarily, I suppose everybody's different. I'm sure uh, personalities you know. coming through, but it was enough of a taste that has me, although I'm not sitting in a circle, I travel so much for work, I have just been sitting by myself. Yes. And although nothing's happened, speaking, of course, if there's nobody to speak to, why would anybody speak through? Probably. But, <laughs> but it, it's still, the passion is still there, the interest, and so... Your words right now just made me feel reassured that I'm on the path. Yes, yeah, yeah, without doubt. I mean, it's it's a strange path to be on, and it's never uh, smooth. It is very smooth running. It's a very smooth path if we let it be a smooth path. The problem is, though, we're humans, and we have brains and minds, and that gets in the way. The only thing that gets in the way of our development really is us. And and I found I've done a very good job of getting in the way of a lot of my development. <laughs> <laughs> I've been quite proficient at getting in the way of my development along the way, you know. Um, and the spirit world has constantly had to prove itself to me time and time and time again. And every time they do it, I'm amazed for a few days. And then the doubting, nagging mind starts to to, to wheel its way around. You, know, you can feel the cogs turning, the, the doubting cogs are going around. And that's been me for the last three or four years. So it, it's us that get in the way of the development mostly, I think, because we, we struggle to accept uh, or we, we, we have an idea of what it should be, you know, and we, we, we cause ourselves these problems. Uh, I, I, I truly think that's probably what, what the biggest downfall in development is, is, is the medium trying to be involved you know yeah could you give us some of those examples of things that have happened even if you've questioned yourself after um yeah yeah well the first question <clears throat> i suppose uh, I, and i don't think there's a medium who's ever developed who hasn't probably answered i think you'd be s some kind of a breed of person if you've never doubted what's happening i think you'd have to be a, a, a different person but uh, I, you know almost from from mars in a way because i think most of us uh, doubt first of all whether this so-called identity that is speaking through uh claiming to be an you know incarnate uh, uh being it, 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 you know are they real is it or is it me and that's the big question that, that I started with, am I inventing it? Am I creating this under pressure to perform, to meet expectation, 
to uh uh, to because I, I am I doing this because I think this is what a medium has to do. That was the first uh, big problem, and it took Monty probably a, a, quite a while to learn to control and speak fluently. But he he mastered it very well, and I sort of did master uh, his medium quite well. But the whole process didn't stop me doubting: Am I inventing this? Is he real? So the first thing they had to do was prove to me that they were real. But before they did that, the personality started to come and join. So I had uh, once really? Monty had got – Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. I, I, I started um, uh, uh, sitting and then another one night, another one turned up. And I was like, I, I can't uh, – is this for real? Uh, I thought he hasn't even proved himself yet. I don't even know if he's real. Um, am I now creating multiple personalities? You know, do I have some kind of psychological illness? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and then but just as that one was starting to get better and proficient, another one arrived. So in the end, I, I have a total of, I think now there is a total who have communicated of about five different communicators. And they all came and joined the circle before I had any proof that they were who they claimed to be uh, or that they were real. And I thought, well, this is this is insane. But I went with it. I thought, well, I've got no choice but to <laughs> go with it. You're this far in, yeah. yeah I, I might as well keep walking. And, and I did. And then we, we started off uh, getting one night with the philosophy was flowing. Monty was very good at bringing his thoughts on life and reality and the world and etc people he, he's very good at that and it was very nice to listen to them uh, to the words afterwards uh, but i you know it didn't answer the, the great question is this real and then all of that changed uh when we had uh when was the first thing i think it was a, a lady who joined the, the spirit team started working and out of the blue one night uh she just told one of the sitters something that was absolutely evidential to her week. Something that had happened in her life. She told nobody about it. It just happened. And she told her what had happened that week and relating to her grandson. And it was fantastic. It was the first breakthrough moment that we had where something evidential had been communicated. Um, and then... From there, we, but I, I, I was over the moon, of course, you, you can imagine. Yes. I thought, this is wonderful. But then after a few days, the doubt started to set in. Well, was it telepathy? Was it, did, has she told me something or insinuated right. this at some point? So I started to create problems uh, again. So uh, we went, a little boy who started working through my mediumship calls himself Anthony he then started bringing quite regular evidence to the sitters. And I, I still would believe it for a week and then start to doubt it again. But I, I was aware that this evidence was starting to grow uh, through the trans state. And, it, and the other thing that would sometimes happen is that if I didn't, I, it's very strange, uh, the Whatever's going to be said, I'm, I don't think about it. It just falls out. But somehow I have a knowing sometimes of what's about to come, a feeling. And if I don't like it, I might start fighting the, the trans process. And that stops the words coming out. So very often I'd, hear, I'd feel something was coming forward. I'd fight the process. And later on in discussion, after the circle had finished and we'd be all having a cup of tea, that very thing that I knew I was fighting one of the sitters would bring it up in conversation. So had I have let it come and not fought with the process and them, actually it would have been additional evidence. But that was my mind getting and allowing my mind to be in the way, you see. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the big game changer came for me when we, uh, one of my circle members, a uh, husband and wife, she's a, uh, a yoga teacher and she has a studio in at her house, she's got a, a townhouse with a big, big loft space in the attic, and it's 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 a big area, holds about twenty people. And she said, thinking and 
in December, she said the last thing to do for the year. I wondered, say no if you want to. Would you like to do a demonstration? She said, no pressure. I'll pick the sitters. I'll make sure every one of them is sympathetic, understanding that they know it's experimental, that nothing might happen. How do you feel? So I gave it some thought and I said, let's do it. We'll we'll do it. So she picked all these sitters. There was about uh, there was five members of my circle plus 17 other people, uh, half of which I think I'd met half of them yeah. and I'd never met the other half. That's a big group. And that it is quite a big group. It was the first experience of doing something like that. But I saw it as a te- uh, uh, in my mind, I saw it as a test sitting. I was going to do exactly what the pioneers of the past did. I was going to follow their method uh, of the scientists of the past who, you know, I, we said before, put their often put their careers on the line to prove this fascinating truth. And I was going to take that path, which was to have a test sit-in with these different types of characters, these different people, half I know, half I don't, and I'm going to sit and we will see what happens. If this is successful, then it will go a long way towards proving to me and not necessarily to my circle because they they had no doubts by then. I had all the doubts. And that night uh, we sat and Anthony, the little boy, came uh, and he said to the two, there was two sitters, and what happened is at the start of the sitting, uh, one of the people, one of the spirit people that worked through me went round every, almost every sitter and introduced themselves by name and they exchanged a few words. And with some of them, they gave specific little gems of information that, that were outside of my knowledge. And they, they would say, yes, that's right, or, or no, if the case may be. And then they'd say, that's fine, we'll return to you later on. And they lined up their contacts at the start of the night, then continued to say what they wanted to say. And then a little later in the evening, Anthony came and started presenting evidence to different people. And I got my evidence really that night because a couple who I'd never met before came and sat. In fact, the gentleman was on the verge of not coming. He didn't think it was something he could sit through. And he sat and the little boy, Anthony, took, uh, gave them some specific evidence to do with Tibet. He explained that they were the only people in the room who would know or have any connection with Tibet, which was true. And he explained that, that his, his evidence around this nature of Tibet. And he then said, I'm going to your house, to which everybody laughed at. But then he, he started describing he started taking them on a guided tour of their own home, describing everything he could see in their house down to minute detail. He then described, he went into each room and described what he could say. I've never been to these people's house. I've only met them that night for mm-hmm. the first time. And at this point, I haven't even met them. I, I stayed out of the way at the beginning and I walked into the room, sat in the chair and went. So I haven't really got to speak to them properly. And then he said to them, and he did something uh, which this was the clinching moment. There was a very famous medium in the 60s called Gladys Osborne Leonard. And Mrs. Leonard's uh, little girl guide uh, was a girl called Fedder. And she was very proficient at giving book tests. And um, that would involve uh, her saying to the sitter, if you go home and go to such a shelf, three shelves, for instance, three shelves down, counting 15 books it's a blue book you open the blue book go to page whatever whatever and you'll find a a passage or a word that says this or that so she sort of got known for these book tests and was experimented on for her book tests because they they went a long way to proving that it was outside of the medium's mind and that night anthony proceeded to take them into one of their rooms tell them there was a bookshelf Tell them how many shelves approximately on that ship on the uh, were on the cabinet. He told them to count down. I think it was three or four to go from left to right about three quarters of the way. There's a book with gold writing on the stem, and it's to do with Tibet. So that you know that 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 was interesting enough. The next day, I got an email from the host to say she's just received this. What do you think? 
And it was a photograph. They'd gone home that night. Together, they'd gone to the bookshelf. They took away the clutter and the photographs and everything that was hiding the books, Christmas cards and things, took them down, went to the shelf, went along. There was a red book, gold writing on the stem, and it was the Tibetan book of living and dying. And I, I get very moved by that yes. because I think that that was the first time and I'd waited all those years. And that was the first time I got my proof that that little boy was who he claimed to be and could prove it. And if he was who he claimed to be, then the others had to be who they claimed to be. And if they are who they claim to be, that means I genuinely am on a path of mediumship development. I am genuinely a medium, regardless of what anybody else might think, (laughs) you know, so that, that was my clinching and changing moment, uh, Sandra. I love that you mentioned that book too, because my journey began in 1996 of a fear of dying. And the first book that I opened that I thought there's something else possible that started me on this journey was the Tibetan book of living and dying. Ah, Well, there you go. And and there's no coincidence that you and I are having this discussion today, as we were saying before we started recording, you know, that there's many synchronicities in our paths and these things happen, you know, these great truths happen. And it's, 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 it's our duty to develop it properly and correctly uh, and and to use it, hopefully one day when we're c- developed to the correct degree, to use it to help people. Yeah. And you and I were talking, too, just before we started recording, that this isn't new. Like this, people were scientists and doctors and professors and teachers and involved in this years ago. Yes. So it's yes. not like a new thing. No, no. It's it's if anything, it, it may be having a renaissance at the moment, but it's nothing new. I mean, I think if you research, uh, I mean, it depends how much truth you want to believe a book like the Bible actually holds. Mm-hmm. But if you do read the Bible uh, that, as I know, Maurice Barbonell did in his book, This is Spiritualism. If you can get hold of that book, it's very hard to find. But I it, have it. it. Is one. Right you have of, it right. right in front of me. I'm looking at it as a matter of there fact. You, now that, that to me is a, is a wonderful, wonderful book. Yeah. Um, because what it does is uh, he mentions at one point that in the Bible, he, he, you know, it is referenced that there were medium, it, that there were cabinets used. They use the, uh, I don't know if it's Arabic or whichever word they, they, that they translated it from. But if you, um, uh, if, if you take that word, it basically means, small structure and apparently uh the 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 disciples and what have you one of them sat inside this small structure and i think it was elijah and uh and whoever materialized appeared in white well to me that they are describing a medium sitting in a cabinet and the white that they are describing is the ectoplasm from the medium so that's one account that is 2,000 years of age. Yes. If you, if you look at the Quran, it says that Muhammad went into the, in, into the darkness. And, and he, when he went into the dark, he, uh, you know, he, he heard the voice of God. Well, that suggests to me that he was either a, a, a clairvoyant or potentially a direct voice medium uh, where the voice was emanating out of the air because of the power that he had. So these accounts are going back thousands of years. And then if you bring just our modern history into it, you've got uh, not modern so much, but if you go back to the 19, uh, the 18th, late 1800s, right the way through to the 1940s, you had, um, you had Flammarion and you had William Crooks and you had John Logie Baird, the, the man who invented television communication and broadcast and what have you. So you had all these people putting their careers on the line to testify and tell people that there is a truth in their research. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those people suffered the, 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 the backlash of their peers uh, who had no knowledge, no experience, but they suffered it and they stuck their ground. You know, how many researchers would do that now? Not many. So true. And I don't remember the quote 
that you had mentioned at the beginning. I'll see if I can find it, if it was Gandhi or who, but the innovators were first laughed at. Can you try to recreate what you said yeah. before we started yeah. recording? I think I do think it was Gandhi. If I'm wrong, then then correct me. But uh, but I, they said that all truth passes through three stages. Firstly, it is laughed at and ridiculed. Secondly, it is violently opposed. And finally, thirdly, it is accepted as self-evident. And you find it with any person, you know, who's given us wonderful things. Uh, or discoveries of life. Firstly, they they were laughed at for their beliefs and and their ideas. Then once they started to uncover the truth and find evidence, the the stick in the mud people who are happy and complacent start violently opposing their work. They'll throw religion at it. They'll throw everything they can find at it to, to stop it. But then eventually, if the truth continues to come out, eventually everyone accepts it as self-evident. Of course, she survived death. Huh. We always knew that, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's 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 the same with most of our greatest inventors um, and scientists who've made great discoveries, you know, and they'll be doing it forever. It's, it seems to be the common process, <laughs> but it, it is the process. Mm, and we're working in that direction and even holding our mobile phone these days. I have an iPhone and just take it for granted. I mean, I can get every bit of information that exists in a second or less. It's, yes. It's getting pictures broadcast from all over the world. Now there's all these live cameras on YouTube and it's not yeah. connected to anything. And that's pretty miraculous. Well, you know, years ago, my first job, I worked for British Telecom, uh, telecommunications. Um, and that was when I left school, I went to work for them. And what you've just said about the iPhones and smartphones this would have been back in 1999, 2000. Uh, I left there in 2001, I think, at the end of 2001. And my manager there had been to a conference uh, or uh, some kind of gathering that the managers went to. And she said to me and, and the team of people I worked with, we asked her, how did it go and what did you see? And she said, well, she said, you're never going to believe it. I played with a f- this device, a phone. She said it was a, it was like a mini computer and you'd poke the screen. She said, and it had the internet on it. It was your telephone. It had a camera. It had calendars. It had this, it had that. She says, and they say that we're all going to have these in the next uh, seven to eight years once the infrastructure grows. And I said, it's never going to happen. <laughs> I can't see that. You know, it sounded right. nonsense. I mean, why would I want a camera attached to my phone? I just want to make a phone call mm-hmm. <laughs> and look at it now. So I, I, I you know, the, the, that technology was there several years before we got it. So it makes you wonder what is known and what isn't known, doesn't it? I mean, it makes you wonder what scientists at the highest levels know about the afterlife. To them, it could be an absolute truth. And and they could be very, very aware that we are influenced and guided. Hence why so much effort is made to keep people's minds down these days. You know, lock you in your job, lock you in front of the television, keep staring at your phone. Seems to be the common path that we're all on. Years ago, 50, 60 years ago, with, without those distractions, many more people sat to do, develop their spiritual side. Not necessarily mediumship, but their spiritual side, their connection with whoever it was there that they believed in, you know, and people don't do that anymore because we have, we are a technology driven society and we are taught being taught to work long hours, accept our acquiescence Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and our place and to keep staring into the box every night. You know, it's to me, the home circle is wonderful because it's the moment where we keep the outside world out just for that hour and a half or so. And then afterwards, we come together as friends and have some food and and drink. And we see it as our moment to keep the rest of the world out just for one night a week, you know. And that's to me, that's a very important part of the process. It's the bonding and coming together, you know. Yeah. And I think hearing stories from my grandmother, although she wasn't involved with spiritualism, but 
there wasn't the television, there wasn't anything. So families would get together with their musical instruments and friends and they'd sing, they'd laugh. And so it's no wonder some of the great stories we hear of the great physical mediums and trance mediums of the past, they were already getting together, you know, in circles of, so, so to speak, and having this joy and camaraderie and it's, it was the perfect environment then for the spirit world to step into it. And that doesn't yes. exist now. No, it doesn't. I mean, I can tell you from, from research and, and people's accounts uh, who knew these people and who, people who have known uh, family members of these people of the past, mediums of the past. One of them was Alec Harris and the other one was Minnie Harrison. Uh, I've heard the accounts of Minnie Harrison's son, Tom, who is now taking his uh, his uh, uh, his progression to the to the next world. He told the accounts of his mother's mediumship and the, the physical phenomenon, the, the materializations uh, that they had of their loved ones. And, he, you know, he explained how. At the back of the shop, the, the, the people where they held the circle was in a couple, couple of shop holders and that the house was at the back of the shop. And every Saturday night, they, they'd already for a few years been meeting up together as friends. And then they just decided, why don't we have a circle? So they'd already been sitting for uh, as a circle for a few years before the circle actually formed into such a thing. And the same could be said for Alec Harris, who was probably the greatest if, if not the greatest materialization medium of the last since ever that we can we know of and he was a welshman and in the valleys of wales uh back in the 60s and before 1960s and going way back there was not a street uh every, there were circles everywhere um home circles were, were everywhere in that part of the world and now you probably struggle to find one because the distractions are such, you know, we, we do have to, we do have an unhealthy habit of being distracted. And to me, the home circle is that important time of the week when you put the world away and let it go just for that one, just give yourself that one and a half hours of, of, to be with these other people from the spirit world and for you to be together as friends, you know. That's a beautiful thing. And I'd like to talk a little bit about sacred dance with trance. <laughs> I've had yes. Kathy Beltran on the show, and I know you're involved with the Facebook group. And I think things like this show and her show and so many wonderful people are sharing, you know, we're we're letting people know what's happening in the world and what's possible. And my passion, although I love all these interviews, is studying trance and physical mediumship and like what's possible, you know. And uh, yes. I'm grateful that you have – you guys share that facebook group sacred dance with trance and then she's got the show because if you if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about what that is and what's available there yeah well i came into uh kathy and i came into each other's radars uh back in the summer and it was through uh, a mutual friend uh who who gave one of the first interviews uh to the to the program uh, and he's a developing medium, I believe. If I'm if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I'm I'm wrong. But he's he's quite in his early stages. So Kathy wanted to get an idea of people from all perspectives. So somebody who's been sitting for twelve months, somebody who's been sitting for a couple of years, somebody who's been sitting for fifty years. You know, uh, people who are trans mediums through to physical medium, uh, through to any phenomena that's associated with friend, uh, with trance, from healing to independent voice to whatever is out there. Uh, and I, I was, the, I think, one of the second or third interviews she gave. I, did, I have to be honest, you know, I had a big thing about breaking my privacy zone and speaking about these things because I was told, I, I always considered my two mentors to have been Robert Goodwin and Stuart Alexander. And Stuart Alexander took the uh, – it's been, always been one of my first ports of call when I've got a problem or a concern that I need to overcome. And and usually he send, sends me the, the exact same date email every time because I'm usually presenting him with the exact same scenario and problem that I'm creating. Yes. But he always said to me that uh, 
it's it's not for a medium to speak about themselves. That's what he was told by his, one of his mentors uh, way back, a man, a man called Alan Crossley. It's not for mediums to speak about themselves. That's for other people to do. So I had a real big deal about going live and giving an interview because I did agree to a point that I didn't want to come across as egotistic. I didn't want to come across as a know-it-all. Uh, I didn't want, but I, I also realized that I've done a lot of research, a lot of study, and I've sat to develop this thing. And I've now had the proof, you know, that, that these people are real. So if I can be of any assistance. So Kathy gave, agreed to do an interview um, uh, or asked me, would I agree to do an interview? And I said, yes. And we did it pretty much there and then. I think the next day, in fact, we connected. She asked me questions. I just went in blind, didn't want to know what she was going to ask me. And we just went for it. And since then, I think I did another one since then, uh, which was I was talking about mediums from the past. So I gave a presentation uh, on two mediums that have interested me uh, in my own development and uh, over the years. So I did a presentation. And through that I got to know Kathy a lot more and Nikki Eagles is also the other admin in the group and um, we we speak virtually every day now uh, yes. using using WhatsApp we leave each other silly messages and and uh, wind each other up and tease each other and and discuss the group when posts come in do we think that is relevant or not relevant uh, is th- somebody puts a picture of a blurry face on there is this transfiguration <laughs> I don't know it just looks just looks like a blurry face to me you know so yeah, we have these yeah. discussions you know Kathy's very much the the um I would say she's she's very much um I, I, what's the right way to word it she's she's a, a caring kind soul who doesn't want to ever upset people and she's always conscious of that uh Nikki is 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 a great balance to have there because she she's also that way inclined but she's she's down probably down a notch is the way I describe it. And then you've got me, I'm like a thorn between two roses. I, I'm, I'm the super analytical sitting there questioning everything. And, and I, I present the element of doubt in the discussion. So good. between us, we have a good mixture of personalities, a good mixture of views and different knowledge from different perspectives so that we can try and bring the best to the group. And, and that's the aim. It, you know, when, when it started, I don't think Kathy fully knew which way it was going to go. She just knew she had to do it. And when she asked, would I become an admin? I thought, well, yes, I will, because th- there's a lot of sharing that I can do about mediums of the past, about their development, about how they do and, and mediums of the present. There are you know developing today some good mediums sure. i mean stewart is in his 50th year uh david thompson's tour uh, i think he's took a bit of a back seat but he's touring uh, was touring the world demonstrating physical mediumship yeah. scott scott milligan who i know you're aware you, you've interviewed he's his trance and his physical mediumship is way down the line of development he's you know he's probably in his 15th to 17th year something like that so he's developing uh, so even today, we do have these mediums. It is possible to develop it. It's not gone. It's just our desire. And I think Sacred Dance with Trance is trying to to uh, help people in a social networking world that we live in to just bring some of these people together or at least inspire them to keep sitting. That's my my stance on it. If we encourage people to start sitting, but if we even encourage people to keep sitting, that's just as important. Oh, I think it's great. And it's interesting they brought up Stuart and his words because uh, he, he will be a guest on this show coming up very soon. And um, he's got a, he's compiled and I know you've helped compile a beautiful double CD album called Physical Seance Room Reco- Recollections. And they're fantastic. And I know when I spoke to Stuart about the interview, he says, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about them and the uh, senior spiritualists and all those people that put their voices on cassettes with all their stories and it and I get it and it's not an ego based thing but I also think anyone listening to you right now Warren knows that you're caring and you're sharing and we want to hear from somebody who was a skeptic that was on this road so it's not so I bottom line is I thank you for being on your journey and sharing because it helps all of us. I mean, you've helped me tremendously with my own development. Think, oh, let's have a little more well, patience that's... here, Sandra. 
Of course, yeah, and that is what it's all about. I mean, unfortunately, I've never met, uh, until I moved into the spiritualist movement uh, or the area, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm a, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a spiritualist um, because I'm, I'm not interested in religion at all. And spiritualism since the 1950s has been dogged with this religion tag on it. Prior to that, it was never such a thing. It was a movement. It was a realization. Uh, it was proving nature, which, of course, nature requires no religion. But it, it has been dogged with this. But I've never considered myself as a spiritualist. But if I was to say that since I moved into the area of spiritualism and mediumship, I have never in my life come across such a community of backbiting, bitchiness, criticisms and people at each other's throats determined to scramble over the people to, to, to achieve what they want. And that's been one of the, 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 the saddest things is realizing that spiritualism uh, and mediumship is beautiful, but not all of the characters within it are. And I think from my perspective, realizing that my aim is to be the change you want to see in the world. I to like be it. different to that. And in order to help people, you you do have to stick your head above the parapet, I suppose, and take that chance, the gamble, which is what I did with Kathy's interview. Exactly what I'm doing with your interview today. Mm -hmm. If my words help one person to to maybe not do what I did and over question or create so many blocks, then you you've helped one person. If you've helped one, that could be the very thing that the world needs that support and encouragement people to be friends yes we do have to look at things analytically yes we do have to question whether there's a perfectly plausible explanation from time to time for some of what happens sure. but once you've ticked away all those things if you still keep coming back then there's a good chance that you're proving survival if you're doing that and you can encourage people to do that which is what your interviews do uh, which is what Kathy's interviews do, which is what Stuart's talks do, uh, and anybody else. If you're doing it with with kindness and sincerity and, and of purpose and and you're being a good person in the process, well, then you, you, you're proving that you can be better than what went before and you're doing your bit, aren't you? Yeah, there's so much grief and pain in the world. And if we can help lift somebody's spirit, so to speak, and give them hope and even set people forth on their own journeys because there's no reason why after listening if somebody's interested in this they can't start sitting right well, exactly you've you've got a choice haven't you in life you can you can you can be somebody who's a, a a theory obsessed person they're the people who read all the books but they don't put it they, they can tell you what meditation might do for your life they can tell you what this might do for your life. It's the equivalent of the kind of person who they can tell you how to, they've got the book that tells you how to assemble the car. Right. But unless you actually put your hands in and get them dirty and actually start practically working, then you're only ever playing games with theory. So it's the difference between you, your choices. You can be a theory worker. You can be theory and practical together. Or the alternative is that you could get your proof from the medium and you could say, well, that's it. It's proved it. I, I now know I won't die. Yeah. And that'll do for me. And I'll carry on with my life in a happier way. And I'll, I'll enjoy every day as it comes, knowing that there is this next world that's very similar to ours on the horizon, you know, and you'll, you will meet up with your, your friends, your family, your siblings, your, whoever. So you've got those choices. And if People have the choice to make. Some people, it's not for them. Some people are better uh, speakers, like we say, those scientists in the past, that they, they were never going to sit to develop it. But it, through their skills, they were able to bring it forward. Uh, journal, journalists or people who do interviews like yourself and like Kathy, you're using what is naturally within you to help spread the word. So whether you choose to sit and develop is irrelevant. That's If you do, it's fantastic. If you don't, it doesn't matter because you're using your skills to help the spirit world in that way and to help the mediums who to, to help other people. So everybody's playing their part in this vast, big network of cogs turning around. You know, it's, it's fascinating when you look at it that way, but everybody can have the, their own individual part to play 
if they want to, you know. Yeah, and follow what you're passionate about. Over well, in my life, I know some people that say you're either watching from the stands or you're on the court. And I think of basketball yes. when I hear that. But that's the same in this. You can do all the reading and exploring, and that's all fine. But for me, going from faith in the afterlife to believing in the afterlife to now where I am, there is no doubt about it, knowing. <laughs> and Yes, it is a step. You know, you, you, you go from uh, – how can I put it? You go from uh, theory – it's a it's a theory to a, I do have a belief. Then your belief becomes uh, certainty, and then gradually you move towards knowing. You know, and there's no better way of experiencing it than through yourself. And I bet, like me, your life has been enriched with the knowing and everything that you've done. Um, it's <laughs> it's it's a strange one to answer. It must be enriched um but of course I, I get very easily pulled into the area of everything that's ever made me doubt yeah so because i have that questioning mind if i was somebody who was how could i put it away with the fairies a bit more <laughs> new age <laughs> yes. new age you're out there and all that you know hey man <laughs> if i was a bit more like that i'd probably be superly enriched by it in fact, I, I know I must be, but because I approach it with a very analytical, straight set mind, to me, it's like trying to discover something and uh, the atom. So I approach it from a very, uh, I don't know if you know what the right word would be, but if you understand, I approach it from that very analytical yes. avenue direction. So I suppose I'm, I, I, I must have been enriched because I do find myself quoting some of the philosophy that I've heard come through me from time to time to, to people never say where it came from, but I just say, you know, I had a, I had a wonderful saying, you know, from somebody once and I, and I, I repeat it, you know, and, and it helps people. So it, I must be getting enriched by it. Yeah. But I, I tend to so. keep, try to keep my feet hard on the ground because I think once you, your feet start to lift, well, for me anyway, if my feet were to lift off the ground and get too carried away with it, it, it could, I don't know, I, I don't say it would damage the mediumship, but I do worry that it might undo the process or not help it. So I tend to keep my feet on the ground and look at it from a very uh, analytical, scientific, if I can, approach as yeah. best I can. And that's good. But I know, it's helped. I know it's helped other people. I know that people have had their loved ones' survival proved to them uh, through my mediumship. Uh, I know a doctor a GP sat with me once, general practitioner, um, normal family health doctor, but she's a, a nice lady, an intelligent lady. She looks outside the box. She sat with me one night and I know her brother did his best to communicate and bring evidence that he'd survived. And he, as far as we could see, you know, he, he'd done a very good job of that. And that was good for her. And that was a doctor. So I think if you can convince a doctor or somebody of that way of mind, then it's it's good. Oh, it's it's you, you've done your job. And I think that's part of the purpose. It's the healing of bereavement, isn't it? I agree. I agree. I, I think some of the phenomena that happens in some of these seances, things that I've seen other people share on Facebook or whatever, I think it's interesting. But for me, I'm going after the proof of the survival, those stories that will help yeah. a grieving heart. I, I agree. I mean, you could argue that – you really could argue that physical phenomena – in the dark in itself proves nothing. I mean, it does prove something. Uh, it proves that that this can happen. Um, even if sci some scientists want to argue it away to uh, psychokinetic kin kinesis and things like that, even if that was the case, I'd say it's still a bloody good discovery that we can do that. Yeah, I agree. Or that the mind is capable. Sure. Um, but the fact that it does happen is worthy of investigation in itself. And it is wonderful. I mean, to sit in a room when the trumpet goes up in the air or or such like, or you hear the spirit world speaking in direct voice form is truly wonderful. But I see them all as sticks uh, or sticks of pasta. You know, if you take a spaghetti pasta, you can just snap it. It's so brittle and easy to snap. Mm -hmm. But if you take so if you take all of those sticks and you take many of them, it becomes harder to break. 
and I see them like that. Each one is like an individual individual strand of sp- spaghetti pasta, so breakable on its own. But if you put them all together, and then if you wrap them up in the string that binds them together, which is to me the string that binds it all together is evidence of survival beyond the grave. Mm-hmm. If you wrap that around it, it becomes a very hard thing to snap because together they all go together to make a stronger, a much stronger case. And I think that's what the phenomenon is all important. You know why it's all important. Uh, I've seen through Stuart and I've seen it through Scott. I've seen the trumpets whizzing around. I've seen objects ringing and knocking on the table. I've seen the medium tied to the chair. In Stuart's case, he wears aluminum stickers on his knees. So you always know where he is. You can see him. And I've seen him get levitated into the air about six foot. Uh, and speak from the air. He woke him up from his trance whilst he was up there, and he weren't very keen on it. No, <laughs> he didn't incredible. like. Incredible. But but you see, each one of those on their own could be argued away by a skeptic or a scientist yes. or some some magician like James Randi who wants everybody to do it his way. But you put them all together and wrap it up in survival evidence, then you you're starting to build a stronger case you know for the whole process and i think that's the important thing so evidence to me is everything there is serious lack of evidence out there particularly in trance states years ago there was you can read history is rich with mediums of the past trance mediums who not only gave philosophy or addresses uh opening addresses and services in trance but they also gave evidence Loved ones sometimes even spoke through the medium uh, themselves would try and attain control. History is rich with that. But today, I, the way I see it, there's 100,000 trans mediums. There's one on every street corner, it seems. Yeah. And they've got endless wisdom. But I never see much evidence coming forward. And I wonder why that is. Uh, I, d- I don't think I could give it, anyone can give a definitive answer. But it just leaves you to question whether we're developing correctly. Uh, and to me, the, the, the correct way for developing trance and then if you wish to or intend to go forward is to, is to make those conditions as perfect as history has shown it to be. And that's that's what I've done. That's what my circle's done. It's what people like Stuart and Scott have done. Yes. And it proves that if there's a process that works, you know, why break it? I'm, I'm following those guys. Right, right. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Uh, does... Um... The people that speak through you, is it only when you're in trance or can you hear Monty in your mind? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I was having this discussion recently with a medium friend of mine, Nicole de, uh, Nicole de Haas. Uh, she recently did an interview for us, but I've, I got to know Nicole when the two of us demonstrated at Stuart's uh, biannual seminar in mm-hmm. England. And uh, we we had this discussion the other day because Nicole uh, is a trans medium and she's a physical medium, but she's also and and she's 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 a very good trans and physical medium, but she's also a very good clairvoyant and she can have that conversation with them. So she can hear. Well, I don't know how she hears it, whether it's mental impression or audible in the ear, but either way, she has what we call mental mediumship. You know, she has that ability. Um, I've always said I don't have that. I, I just don't. I, I, I either go into trance or I don't. Uh, but I have found that certain things in my life, uh, certain situations, certain uh, things I might have said uh, of late or been inspired to say have later been connected with one of my spirit people. So you could argue that perhaps they influence me uh, through the mind in a much subtler way than perhaps they can influence Nicole or another medium of that nature. So I would say no, because I have no conscious awareness that they communicate through me. But I have it has been proved that some things I've said from time to time have been proven accurate. So you could say they have a subtle connection, maybe that I'm just not so conscious of. Oh, that's a great answer. That's a personal question for my own journey. <laughs> yeah. So many people yeah, say, it's... oh, they say, tell me this and all oh, this one speaking. And I just quiet my mind. I thought, 
Really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very strange thing. I mean, no, no, no two forms of mediumship or any form of mediumship is the same. You know, in the same manner as nobody's fingerprints are quite the same, and nobody's even two identical twins are not quite identical in every way. And I think mediumship is exactly the same. Uh, it's it's to be developed uniquely. I think people will discover. Some people discover that they have these unique strange quirks about their mediumship you know so some people can quieten their mind i'm sure and that they can hear the inspiration of that world um myself doesn't seem to happen for me i can sit in meditation if i want to and 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 i don't feel i hear the spirit world i think i did have two cases in my, that i can say i remember i went on a meditation retreat where you sit in stern silence for 10 days solid um and in that site one of the days i did start to get mental pictures and when i came out of the the course and was allowed to speak again and communicate with the outside world because uh, it was like being in a in a uh, monastery really um i couldn't wait to ring my friend and say did i saw this and he was like that is so my dad that is my dad. Wow. You've described him to a T. And whilst I was on the meditation retreat, he'd been in Thailand because uh, he's a yoga practitioner. And he'd been in Thailand at, where he qualified to teach yoga. And he was back there as a student. And he'd had a dream. Um, his dream matched what I saw in my meditation. So it, it, it's possible. I think we just have to accept that mediumship is unique and it took me a long time to accept that you know that that what happens to one doesn't happen to another and you can't necessarily expect another medium to give you all the answers because a true medium would tell you that everybody's different we can just we can just be your support if you like and help you to bring it out of you uh, but you have to do the, the the hard work you know and these strange quirks of clairvoyance or clairsentience Perhaps they do exist. People ca who can quieten their mind and hear their guides speaking to them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's never happened to me in a conscious nature, though. Unfortunately, I wish it would. It'd be fantastic. You never know. And I, I talk to many guests, and they say the first start step is quiet your mind, whether you call it meditation or before you go to bed or during the day, just and just say to the spirit world, "I'm here. Use me." Yeah. You know, and let's develop that relationship, and then just quiet your mind and start there. So it's something we can all do, and we are all so individual, so we don't have to compare ourselves to someone else. I mean, to just get that there may be a person or a team of people that we can't see that are on our side, and um, and it's all great. Yeah. Well, Warren, it is great. I've kept you a long time on this interview, so we should probably wrap things up. But is there anything else you want to share that I haven't, uh, that you haven't said? or? Um, no, not really. I, th I think we've covered everything. All I would want to do is to encourage people listening to this to sit and develop their mediumship if, they, if, if they're inspired to do so. And, and also be happy to accept what situations come your way to work for the spirit world in many different ways. You know, don't believe you, you have to only be the mediumship finding as, as Nicole, uh, my friend, Nicole said, finding a, a physical medium is rare, but finding a good circle is also equally probably more rare than a good physical medium. So, you, you know, it's, it's encouraging people to go forward and develop what's brought towards them. And, Yes, I, I would recommend that people rush out and do buy the, you know, the Stuart Alexander CDs uh, so that they can hear the voices of senior spiritualists from the past actually telling you what they experienced. That seems so rare today. In fact, it, it's unbelievable, but it happens. So I, I'd like to encourage people to to develop correctly uh, yes. and, you know, develop in a in a in a manner that allows them to not accept everything just because they th because they think it is but to question everything and let the development bring 
greater truths every time. That's what I'd like to see. And that's what I'd like to think I would help people to do if I could. So that's all I would end with, unless there is another question you don't no, think I've covered. No, I think it's great. And for our listener, know that in the description of this episode, I have a link to Sacred Dance with Trance and to the CD we're talking about, Physical Seance Room Recollections. And if you're just listening and you can't access that, you can go to stuartalexandermedium.com and find the information there. Uh, so Warren, thank you really from the bottom of all of our hearts for being our guest today. Oh no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm rather uh, surprised that uh, these avenues are opening up to me all of a sudden and I'm taking them because I don't believe life brings you what you don't need. So everything must be coming for a reason. And to think that I'm being interviewed alongside the, the likes of Scott Milligan and Stuart yeah. Alexander uh, is is rather strange, <laughs> but it's 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 a, a pleasure. It is. I'm I'm humble about. It. I try to remain humble about it. It is a pleasure. It is a privilege, and I thank you for the work that you do and keep doing it because it's it's important. I love it. And I know not everyone can come with me on some of the adventures I'm on. So if we can share this way, it's fantastic. But I do recommend yeah. everybody, if you're interested, get on the court. You know, yes, read, but explore, sit, maybe create a circle, a home circle. And it's there's so much pleasure and joy being with like-minded people. Oh, and I also want to invite our listener, if you haven't already, we have a Facebook group. You can just type in We Don't Die Listeners, and there's uh, over 3,000 people now that are just gathering and like to talk about this and support each other through grief and, it, you know, all kinds of conversations we have. And also, we do have the group Sacred Dance with Trance on Facebook. There's a link in this um, description. So I want to just close out by just a couple of brief announcements. They, we are going to be at, well, we, me and some other folks, not Warren as of yet, but in September um, 2018 in Scottsdale, Arizona, we have the annual afterlife symposium that we actually do have scientists and mediums and we have both David Thompson and Scott Milligan who will be there for that physical mediums and some trance mediums joining for a weekend, which will be beautiful. Afterlifesymposium.org is the website to find out more. Our home base for now more than 240 episodes is we don't die radio.com. So you can click on all kinds of past episodes. In closing, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being someone who is interested in what's possible. And so by you being here and spending this hour with us really shows me that you are somebody who's really looking at life and yeah, this is it. What's possible? And <laughs> I know, and even if we can't describe how much it's enriched us because we are living in our own skin, you know, things become normal. Even talking to Scott Milligan with all the phenomena that he's experienced, it's all just become normal. And it's interesting how our human minds do that. But it really is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And we're on this extraordinary journey. And I do have so many new friends and I love it. I love this. And I also, like Warren, have these times that it's like, did that really happen? I have to question. I don't know. Yeah, that's part of being human, too. I don't know if we're supposed to remember 24-7 who we really are. But I do believe uh, that life is an education for our soul, that our lives here are important, that we are these spirits and souls having a human experience. I do believe that. And our lives are very important. So my name is Sandra Champlain. I want to thank you for listening to We Don't Die Radio. And we'll see you soon.